Please welcome again, Heather Murgatroyd. Heather has been a respiratory therapist since 1994. In 2001, she cross-trained in sleep and worked in sleep until 2018. She also worked in the pulmonary function lab for six and a half years. In 2019, she took her first job as a clinical specialist for Methapharm. As a clinical specialist, Heather has developed and provided continuing education programs throughout North, Central, and South America. She also trains new customers and provides feedback on new product development. Please welcome Heather when she presents indirect bronchial challenge testing. Her speech is sponsored by Methapharm. saying I can't share my screen. Hi everyone, um, welcome back. I hope you had a good lunch. Um, I am still Heather Murgatroyd. I still work for Methapharm. If you were here earlier um, for the Is It Asthma Before Lunch. Um, so just again, the disclaimers that I have, um, I do work for Methapharm. We do um, manufacture and distribute provocoline um, worldwide. And then we are also the North American distributors of Aridol. Um, in this particular presentation, I will be mentioning both of these products again in the context of them being bronchial provocation agents um, in the diagnosis of asthma. So onward. Um, your music before was really good. It got me all hyped up um, after my lunch. I hope it did the same for all of you. Um, and I just real quick before I go through the objectives, I just want to say thank you very much um, to Colleen and all the committee for um, giving me the opportunity to present to all of you um, and for, for putting this on, to meeting the challenge and bringing a really great um, conference to all of you. So thank you so much for all your efforts. Um, hopefully next year we'll all be together because I do think um, that's just as big a part as, as the education part of things. So during this presentation on indirect bronchial challenge testing, um, we're going to go through the diagnostic process of asthma and that phenotype of EIB, which is exercise-induced bronchial constriction. Talk about the indications and contraindications for testing. Um, talk about the different indirect bronchial challenges that are available and which patients will benefit. So there is a little bit of overlap from the previous presentation. I'll dive a little bit deeper into the different tests though. So um, I, I love this talk for both pulmonary function lab therapists, but also for those of us who work on the floors and are in the ICUs and not doing the diagnostic side of things, because you don't always know what they do in the PFT lab, right? There's lots more than just spirometry. So I think this gives people who are not in the pulmonary function lab a really good look at what are the diagnostic tests that are available to our patients to ensure that we really, really have the right diagnosis. So what is asthma? We know this, it's a common disorder, it's chronic, it's complex. Um, there's lots of symptoms and they're reoccurring and there's airflow obstruction, bronchial hyperresponsiveness, and there's inflammation. Our patients have underlying inflammation, which is really important to address um, because we know that chronic inflammation can lead to uh, faster degradation of um, lung volumes and lung health and can lead to other chronic diseases. So throughout this presentation, I'm gonna talk about a patient um, and kind of bring the picture all together utilizing this patient. So we have a 32 year old man who goes to his primary care physician complaining of chest tightness and wheezing um, and it causes him to have some shortness of breath. He's an active guy, he runs a couple times a week and he swims a couple times a week. He has a history of this, so we can assume that he's fairly conditioned um, and he's working as a real estate agent. So you know, maybe some days are, are, he has a lot of exertion from work, maybe some days not, I guess, depends on how many tours he's doing. So obviously if we were together, I would be able to see your answers, um, but just, 
you know, answer this um, on your own or if you're with a group or however you want to do it. Um, so as far as this patient goes, we know he's at the primary care physician. This is where most of our patients start their path when they're looking for that asthma diagnosis or they're trying to determine if that's what they're dealing with is they start in the primary care's office, primary care physician. So at that first visit, will the physician gather a detailed medical history, do a physical exam, do spirometry? And the answer is he should, they should do all. He, she, whether it's a physician or a PA or an, an MP, they should do all of that. And that's what our, our guidelines tell us, that we're going to do that initial workup. This patient has no history of asthma. He has no history of heart disease. His vital signs are stable. Um, his breath sounds are clear and equal bilaterally. So that's our patient. So again, kind of reinforcing that the um, NIH and our guidelines tell us, gather that history, do a physical exam, um, determine if he has airflow obstruction, do spirometry. Some clinics have the ability to do with and without bronchodilator, some do not. Um, and if, if we need to do more studies, that's where they can come from. The, the, the primary care physician can order additional testing um, if they're comfortable with it. So this patient had pre and post bronchodilator um, spirometry. It was inconclusive. Um, he is still experiencing those asthma-like symptoms. He reports a couple times a week that he has that chest tightness and that wheezing. Um, he is not, he doesn't have any long-term issues with breathing. Um, it doesn't stop him from doing his activities um, that he enjoys, the running and the swimming and you know, playing sports. Um, but he does tell the physician that he noticed last week that he could correlate his shortness of breath to the days that he worked out. However, it didn't prohibit him from doing his workouts. So what should the doctor do next? A chest X-ray, a CBC, or a six minute walk test? So he had spirometry at, with and without bronchodilators, didn't give us a clear answer. That would be the indication for a bronchoprovocation test. At this point, if the spirometry is normal and the patient is, is reporting asthma-like symptoms, that's when we can start going down the bronchoprovocation row. So this algorithm um, I think is really great. It's just very straightforward. The patient presents with symptoms. We take the history. We do the spirometry with bronchodilators. If it's positive, good, we can move forward. If they had that response to, their, uh, to the bronchodilator, we can create an action plan um, and monitor and follow up with, you know, follow up and monitor them um, to make sure we keep their um, symptoms under control. However, it's not unheard of or unusual to have a patient have normal spirometry when they're just randomly in the office and not necessarily complaining of symptoms. And that's where the bronchoprovocation testing becomes, comes into play. So those tests that I talk about in the Is It Asthma presentation, this is where they come in. When your patient's spirometry is normal or near normal, um, we can take another step. If it's positive, that can, can help to confirm an asthma diagnosis. Or if it's negative, then we need to take another route. We need to look at why are they reporting these symptoms? If it's not pulmonary, what else could it possibly be? So a bronchial challenge is a stimulus of the airway. It's either gonna be with a direct or an indirect stimulus and it's going to cause those airways to show hyperreactivity that we see in asthma. So keep in mind that non-responsive, normal, and I say normal in quotes, um, lungs do not respond to uh, the bronchoprovocation agents. So again, just you saw this slide before, those direct challenge tests, methicoline, histamine, they work directly on the smooth muscle receptors in the lungs. Um, their strength lies in their ability to rule asthma out. If we are you know, wanting to rule out asthma, if someone has a, is applying for a job where they, it's really important that we know whether or not they have asthma, say they are going to um, be in the service, but as I had said before, if they were a military recruit, however, pilots, um, police officers, firefighters, um, deep sea oil rig repair guys. I don't know what their official title is. Um, I know that they will have um, 
tests if they have any airway hyper responsiveness issues. Um, one of the other uh, jobs, so I'm in Northern Illinois, so I don't, I'm not on a coast, um, but one of the jobs that was pointed out to me where they had done a methicoline challenge on was for a, someone who was working um, for a company where they went and they cleaned the underside of the ships. Um, when they were at dock, they would go in their scuba gear and then they would go and they would clean the under belly of the of the of the ships so um you don't want to have an asthma attack in that situation um and so then the indirect challenge tests which are we're going to talk about it more um more during this presentation um exercise eucapnic voluntary hyperpnea or hyperventilation cold air mannitol and hypertonic saline the strength in these is to confirm or to rule in the asthma diagnosis so if you have a positive test, a positive indirect challenge, your physician will take that test result along with your history and your symptoms and you know, develop that asthma diagnosis as appropriate. So when we're comparing um, the tests side by side, the direct go directly to the smooth muscles. They cause that bronchoconstriction to occur if you have susceptible lungs. Indirect, they cause the release of inflammatory mediators. So they act indirectly to cause that bronchoconstriction. So they cause mast cell degranulation and for those inflammatory mediators to be released. And then in the responsive airways, we, saw, we see that bronchoconstriction occur. The beauty of all of the challenge tests, whether they're direct or indirect, is the creators of them um, gave us what, a couple things that are in common. And one of them is that we always refer back to the patient's FEV1, force expiratory volume in one second. So again, thinking back to that spirometry, patient takes that big deep breath in, and they blast it out and they keep blasting it out to plateau. And then they take a big deep breath in. The FEV1, again, is that first second of blasting that air out. All of the direct challenge tests are based on looking at what their baseline FEV1 is at the beginning of the test and seeing how they respond after they have the stimulus of the challenge, what, do, what does it do to their FEV1? We're always going back to that. So that's really nice. So that's common among the different um, challenge tests. So um, that indirect challenge test causes the airways to narrow in response to that stimulus. Um, and again, they stimulate the inflammatory pathways. They are very good at identifying exercise-induced bronchoconstriction. So EIB was formerly known as exercise-induced asthma. However, someone may not have had asthma. They may not have that over kind of umbrella diagnosis of asthma. They may only have bronchoconstriction in response to exercise or, exercise or exertion. So we now call it exercise-induced bronchoconstriction. One of the other things that um, it's, it's helpful with indirect bronchial challenges is that because it's causing inflammation, we see that patients will have a good response most likely to um, the inhaled corticosteroids. So when do we do these tests? When their spirometry, as I said before, is inconclusive. Um, if they have any kind of, you know, airway hyper-responsiveness may be helpful in the diagnosis of chronic cough. Why are they coughing? Um, EIB particularly, and to treat and assess, further assess um, inhaled corticosteroid responsiveness. So if um, you use, if you, you have um, a patient on ICS, their challenge test should be negative, right? If we get rid of that inflammatory process. So as far as the guidelines, um, the diagnosis of EIB in particular, just like asthma overall, should not be um, diagnosed with symptoms alone. Um, they are not specific enough to um, EIB to say, Louise, when you run, you have, you know, you have exercise-induced bronchoconstriction. We need to see what happens when they have um, lung function tests. So when we do them, it's, a, it's serial maneuvers monitoring their FEV1. So they're highly specific, meaning that we, we, we don't get a lot of false positives. If you have a positive test, you can be confident that it's a true positive. Um, they can help us to define, is a, does a patient have exercise-induced bronchoconstriction? 
versus something like exercise-induced vocal cord dysfunction. Because some people only have vocal cord issues when they're exercising. There's actually a really great video on YouTube of a young woman who has um, vocal cord dysfunction in response to exercise, um, just showing you what that looks like. And then it takes her through her testing process. Um, it's pretty dramatic. Um, and you would think that she's having an asthma, asthma exacerbation, but she's actually having vocal cord dysfunction. So as far as the mechanism of action of the indirect challenges, do you think, true or false, indirect challenges cause increased fluid osmolarity in the airways in everyone, regardless of an asthma diagnosis? Do you believe that to be true or false? It's actually true just not everybody has a full-blown asthma response. So like I said, exercise-induced bronchoconstriction used to be referred to as exercise-induced asthma, causes that narrowing of the airways um, after exercise. However, it can occur during the exercise as well. Oftentimes we see the symptoms for EIB present after they've stopped and they do typically self-resolve. However, um, like I just said, they can occur while the patient is exercising. And just because they self-resolve does not mean that they're not troublesome, does not mean that they don't affect the person's ability to perform their sport or their activity. Um, they may stop, they may hold themselves back, they may not per perform optimally. Doesn't mean it's not scary. Um, and so it does need to be addressed. So, Looking at um, why is it so important to use testing to diagnose EIB? Because again, look at these symptoms. We talked about this before as well. Chest tightness, coughing, wheezing, dyspnea. Could be EIB, could be any number of other things. That's why it's so important that we advocate for our patients to get the testing that they need. In the general population, when we're talking about EIB, um, we see about 10 to 20% of kiddos um, having it, and it's more prevalent in girls than boys. I, I've been trying to find out why, um, and I have not been able to find that yet. Um, it's higher in urban settings than rural settings, so there may be an environmental component to it as well. And then we also see in the adult population, so in the general population, about 19% of adults um, are, have been shown to have EIB without a history of asthma. So among athletes, we see EIB in athletes of all levels. It is not just the, com the competitive and elite athletes. We see our weekend warriors. We see the people who are training for the 5Ks or the sprint triathlons with EIB as well. It is, you know, in people who are out hiking, you know, on the weekend. So it is, it's, it's not just exclusive to high-performing athletes. Um, in the high-performing athletes or in the elite athletes, it depends on the sport. Um, the prevalence that's reported. We see it not reported at all in some sports and then others very high incidences of it. So as far as um, we see it with skaters, indoor ice skaters, we see it with cross country skiers and the biathletes. We see it out in the cold. Um, we swimmers oftentimes, especially indoor swimmers, we see EIB high and there may be um, some chemical component in that as well, given that they're indoors in that chlorinated and chemical environment. So it depends on the sport. Um, and then among athletes, just like in the general population, we do see it reported typically higher in the female athletes. Who should be tested? Someone who has no clinical history of asthma, um, but shows the signs of symptoms of asthma when they're exercising or they have that, you know, lung function that's no, pretty much normal during spirometry. Maybe their spirometry is normal because we haven't triggered them the right way. So why should the physician not skip the challenge test and start the patient, just start them on bronchodilator therapy? If you would listen to the last presentation, you should know this answer. Symptoms could be from a cardiac issue. Symptoms could be from a vocal cord issue. A challenge test could help direct precision therapy. It's all of the above, right? We can't just treat on symptoms alone. So just like asthma, EIB should be diagnosed with objective testing. Um, if the spirometry is inconclusive, these are some of the um, indirect challenges that are available to us. 
Um, so we want to make sure that um, we're able to monitor our patients well during the test. If your patient um, uh, has near normal or normal lung function, use that indirect, indirect graded challenge like mannitol or hyper, hypertonic saline because you're monitoring them very closely all the way through the test. So if they're going to start to drop, you see it faster. The dose response test, so I kind of just said this, the dose response tests like mannitol and hypertonic saline um, are good for someone who you're really strongly suspicious of having asthma or has as had asthma in the past um, because we are monitoring them closely. You'll see when I talk about the tests that we don't monitor the FEV1 every step of the way with some of them versus others. So depending on what your patient's history is, that may guide you if you have the um, availability of more than one type of test. So we know that these tests cause that increased osmolarity in the small airways, um, and they can cause bronchoconstriction in responsive airways. So kind of like dries things out and then causes the patient, if they have responsive lungs, to have that bronchoconstriction occur. So the physician listens to the patient and he realizes that he's having symptoms um, after exercising. He becomes suspicious of exercise-induced bronchoconstriction. What type of bronchoprovocation test should the physician order, direct or indirect? Well, it's indirect, obviously, because that's what we're talking about. So I'm gonna, gonna, I'm gonna go through these tests um, in a little more detail. Um, I, I would encourage you that if you're looking for a change in your career, I'm always, I'm always um, encouraging people to say yes to new things. Um, if you have the opportunity to do some work in the pulmonary function lab, maybe one of these tests is, is done in your lab. Um, so you'll be aware of it from listening to this presentation. But I, there's more going on in the pulmonary lab, I think, than people realize. Um, so we're looking to assess bronchial hyperresponsiveness in the presence of exercise. We're looking to assess um, ICS effectiveness for preventing exacerbations. Remember, we want to help our patients avoid as many as exacerbations as much as possible. And then we can also use them to help step down ICS therapy. So if you think back to the, um, the asthma management, we step up adding medications as our patients are gaining control over their asthma. And then once we stabilize them, we start to step down. So that may be, a, that may be somewhere that we could actually apply the indirect challenges um, is in that stepping down of ICS therapy to make sure that our patients are still stabilized. So back to our patient, um, he went to the pulmonary function lab and he had an indirect bronchial challenge. Of course, it was positive. Um, to the indirect challenge. And so the physician diagnosed him with EIB. He was ordered on Saba, on a Saba, and he was, um, he took it 20, about 15, 20 minutes before exercise, which is common. Um, and he's had some improvement with his symptoms, but not complete resolution. So it's better, but it's not optimal. So what should the physician do now? Should he tell him to quit running and swimming? Should he ask him to increase the use of the Saba Q4 while awake? Should he start him on ICS or all of the above? Which do you think the physician will do? Actually, our guidelines tell us that this would be where we would start him on inhaled corticosteroids for his EIB. So it's the second step in treating when the patient is using their Saba daily or it's not effective or it's, or it's not effective. It, if a patient, as I said earlier, if they are on an inhaled corticosteroid, they will decrease the responsiveness to an indirect bronchial challenge. However, it can take up to four weeks um, to obliterate that response. So again, we could potentially consider using the indirect challenges when we're stepping down ICS therapy rather than just going by the patient telling us how they feel, because that's not always the best um, assessment tool that we have. So as far as contraindications for the indirect challenges, um, there's some that kind of go to all of them, and that's what's on here. So cardiac ischemia, uncontrolled hypertension, aneurysm, arrhythmias, recent surgeries, respiratory tract infections, um, 
So things like that for all of the indirect challenges. There are some that are specific to each particular challenge. Um, you may want to reconsider it um, if you're looking at their FEV1. Um, it's diff this is where we see some differences. Remember I said the FEV1 itself is where we're always referring to. But as far as what's an acceptable baseline FEV1, um, greater than 75% predicted for the exercise challenge and the eucapnic voluntary hypoventilation, greater than 65% for the cold air challenge, and then hypertonic saline in mannitol is greater than 70%. For mannitol only, um, it's an allergy to mannitol is a contraindication and allergy to the gelatin used in the capsules is also a contraindication. So another nice um, thing the creators of these challenge tests did for us was to make the very first step in all the challenge tests the same. For every challenge test, we start with baseline spirometry. So they come in and we gather three FVC maneuvers just to make sure that the patient falls within the proper guidelines for the test that they're going to do. Um, so we'll look at it and see that their FEV1 is where it needs to be for whichever test we're doing. And if, they're, if it's acceptable, then we can actually move into the challenge test itself. So the first one that I'll talk about is the most commonly utilized um, indirect challenge, and that's the exercise challenge. So it's a high intensity exercise. It is not just taking a stroll on the treadmill. The patient needs to be working. Um, and that's where the coaching is so important with um, these, these bronchial provocation test, tests that we have. Um, we're trying to get a real life look at what's happening to the patient. With this particular test, it's been around for a long time. We have guidelines that are very well defined. They are current and we can use them in a, we can use exercise challenge um, in adults or in kiddos. So the patient is going to um, run on a treadmill or ride a, a bike for a set amount of time. The thing is, is that we have to get that patient up to their specified heart rate or respiratory rate very quickly. We want them to be at that max or at that percentage of max within a minute or two of starting out. We don't want it to be a leisurely uptake. We want to get them up and then we want to hold them at that target for six minutes. So it is very effort dependent and it is very um, important that we as the therapists are coaching the patients to maintain that. So we don't start to measure their FEV1 until after that maneuver is finished. So after they've run on the treadmill or after they've ridden the bike or run the stairs, whatever um, the lab is doing, um, we measure their FEV1 right away, as long as they you know, have enough breath to do it. And then we measure it at three minutes, six minutes, 10, 15, and 30 minutes. Now your lab, your policy may vary a little bit from what the guidelines say, um, but this is what is in um, the actual technical standards. They also encourage us to continue monitoring their FEV1 out to 30 minutes because there can be a delay in the onset of symptoms. If we see a 10% drop of their FEV1 from baseline, that's a positive test. How do we reverse it? We give them a bronchodilator. So, and that's another commonality with all of the challenge tests is that at the end, if they've had a positive test or if they have, are complaining of symptoms, we give them a bronchodilator to reverse them. So, the exercise challenge is well utilized. It's well respected. Um, it does have some limitations. Um, we take them out of the, the outside environment. So the humidity level in the lab is going to be stable. The temperature is going to be stable. So that can, can you know, have an effect on the outcome of the test. We have to keep them at that target heart rate or respiratory rate. Um, that is, it's, that's essential. We have to be able to do that. Um, when the patient last exercised is important. If they come in and they've exercised prior to their exercise challenge, that will, that will affect the outcomes of the, of the challenge. Um, it, will, it could potentially give you a false negative result. Um, so, but still, it is a good test um, and, and, and it is widely used. It is just, again, I can't emphasize enough, you need to have really good staff doing these tests um, who are experienced in pulmonary function and who are experienced in coaching patients. 
So eucapnic um, voluntary hyperventilation, this is actually an accepted surrogate for the exercise challenge. Um, so the World Doping Agency, the International um, Olympic Committee accept the results of this and some of the other challenge tests in lieu of an exercise challenge. Um, so you don't have to exercise your patient. Um, this may show you some results faster than what you would see um, through an exercise challenge. Um, you do still need some um, specialized equipment for this test. Um, you need a special gas mixture. You need a Douglas balloon, a reservoir bag, and you need some, um, some high pressure tubing. So basically um, with this particular test, I'm gonna, I'm gonna see if my camera can, can come on. Um, for those of you who don't have, or who don't work in the pulmonary function lab, you may not know what an MVV is. So maximum voluntary ventilation. So that's where, how strong are these patients? So when you do this um, EVH test, what you're doing is you're having your patient breathe like they were doing an MVV maneuver for six minutes. And an MVV maneuver looks like this. So deep, rapid breathing for six minutes. Now your patient is not gonna get dizzy while they're doing this test because they're breathing 5% CO2. So they don't get dizzy. However, your respiratory therapist who's coaching the patient through this test isn't, they're breathing room air. And when I demonstrate this, I get dizzy. So one of the labs that I work with who actually does this test, they use a metronome that keeps the patient on track with um, the, the, how often they're supposed to breathe. So I think this is a really interesting test. It is not utilized a lot. Um, I, I only have a handful of labs. I am the clinical specialist for the Western United States. And I only have a handful of labs who are actually, who have the equipment and who do this test. If you're interested in seeing it, there is a really good video for it on um, YouTube that shows you the whole test. So coaching is super, super important. We have them breathe at 85% of their MVV for six minutes. And then like the exercise challenge, we measure their FEV1 right away. And then three, six, 10, 15, and 30 minutes. Again, making sure that we go all the way out to 30 minutes. If we see a 10% or greater drop from their baseline FEV1, it's a positive test. We give them a bronchodilator um, and, and give the doctor the report with the information. So it's a very interesting test to, to watch. Let's see. Um, can be difficult to repeat it, obviously. Um, you know, the, the staffing, if there's any variation in the staff coaching, um, you have to really be trained well as the coach. Um, and it does require that specialized gas mixture. The cold air challenge, um, we basically add cold air to either the exercise challenge or the EVH. And when you do that, oftentimes we require less time um, to yield positive results. And again, like I had said earlier, we use a cold air generator. Um, you follow the protocols from the previous tests. Um, the one thing, I don't see this test being used very often either. Um, the one thing that I have, the feedback I have gotten regarding the cold air challenge is that sometimes the cooling element that they use can be kind of fickle or can be kind of temperamental to, to work with. Um, and you, the thing is, is you don't have to have cold air um, to see EIV. However, um, like I said, it can make things a little bit faster. Um, it might, you know, might, might yield results that you wouldn't see if they didn't have the cold air. So I just don't see it used very often. Um, one of the things that the, the research talks about though with people who, who have EIV or experience symptoms in response to being on, in the cold could actually just be because of the face being exposed to the cold air more so than something happening in the lungs. Like that it's that shock to the face and the skin on the face that's causing the issues. So it's kind of interesting. Um, as far as being able to see how severe um, their bronchoconstriction is, it depends on where they respond during the test. Um, so you are able to do that kind of measurement looking at where and what kind of response they have from their pre-challenge um, numbers. Hypertonic saline. Um, 
I have one lab that has used the hypertonic saline uh, challenge. I don't see it very often. Um, this is what we call an incremental test. So you deliver a dose, monitor their FEV1, deliver the dose, monitor the FEV1. You don't have to buy anything for it. It just takes a nebulizer, your spirometry equipment, um, and hypertonic saline. You can use this one on adults and kids. Um, this test might be really good if you need a sputum sample. Um, so you deliver that the hypertonic saline, you have them breathe for 30 seconds, and then you have them breathe for one, two, four, and eight minutes. You monitor their FEV1 um, after each dose is delivered. Um, and this is like a methacholine challenge. You measure their FEV1 at 30 seconds, and then you monitor it, you measure it again at 90 seconds. We're looking for a 15% decrease from their baseline. If that happens, um, then it is considered a positive test greater than 15%, I can say, because if it's between 10 and 15%, then you after um, a test, you, you repeat that dose. I don't see this test used. Um, like I said, I have one lab in all of, of my states that I know has used this in the past. So have to use an ultrasonic, ultrasonic nebulizer, have to know what you're delivering to your patient. There can be some issues with um, cleaning the machine and disinfecting the machine um, to, to reduce the bacteria growth. Um, and again, like I said, you can generate a lot of saliva with this um, and maybe you can get a, sput a good sputum sample too if you need to. So depending on where they respond during the hypertonic saline, um, you can help the physician can classify their responses um, severe, moderate, moderate, or mild. So if they respond at a very low dose, um, it would be considered more severe um, than if you get all the way through and they respond at the very end or, or don't respond at all. So the Manitol challenge, and again, disclosure that my company um, distributes mannitol, which is called Aridol in um, North America. Just like the hypertonic saline test, this one is also considered an incremental dose response challenge, meaning you deliver a dose, you monitor FEV1. With this particular test, um, you, they are also not required to exercise, um, so there's no capital equipment outlay. Um, just like the hypertonic saline, there is no capital equipment, nor with the um, EVH. Just like EVH, this is also an accepted surrogate test that can be done in lieu of a traditional exercise challenge. It's accepted by the World Doping Agency, by the IOC. Um, if you have an athlete who needs to take medication, this is a challenge that you can do for them. So basically it causes that release of the mast cells that cause that inflammatory response and responsive airways causes bronchoconstriction. Um, so what do you need to do a mannitol challenge? You already have all the spirometry equipment, so you just need to buy the test kit. Um, it comes in a single patient kit um, and that with the DPI and all of the different doses of um, mannitol included. And then you have all of the other stuff already because you're working in a pulmonary function lab. So you're delivering a progressive protocol. You start with a zero milligram dose um, and then you deliver different, the increasing doses of the mannitol throughout the challenge. So you're, you're, um, it's building in the lungs as you're, you're delivering increasing doses. Um, and then, so you deliver it, the patient takes, takes a big deep breath in, holds their breath for five seconds with the mannitol, lets it out. And then 60 seconds after they finish with that inhalation, they, you monitor their FEV1 have them do two FEV1 maneuvers. With all of the tests, um, once you've established their FEV1 through that forced vital capacity, you don't have to necessarily do the full spirometry maneuver because all we want to capture is the FEV1. So these types of tests where you're having your patients do spirometry over and over and over can be exhausting. So if you don't, if your physicians don't require you to do that full FBC maneuver after every dose delivered, that's okay. The guidelines support that. You can just take them out for a couple of seconds exhalation so that you capture the FEV1 because that's what you're looking for. However, the caveat to that is that if your physicians suspect that the patient might have vocal cord dysfunction, you're gonna wanna do the full FBC maneuver throughout the whole entire test.
So with a mannitol challenge, um, a positive test is if the patient's FEV1 drops 15% from their baseline or 10% between two consecutive doses. So if between the 40 milligram and the 80 milligram dose delivered, you see a 10% drop, that's also considered a, a positive test. So 15% overall or a 10% between two consecutive doses. Just like all the other tests, you give them a bronchodilator, you want to make sure that their FEV1 has returned to within 5% of their pre-challenge level before you go, they go home. So because they are inhaling a dry powder, um, they may cough. That is one of the things that some feedback that I get is that it does make people cough. Um, and there are some tips and tricks that you can teach your patient to help minimize the coughing. Um, with all of these tests, um, you need to make sure that your patient is able to do those, multi, those spirometry maneuvers over and over and over, right? They have to be able to follow your directions and they have to have the stamina in order to, order to be able to do it. Um, as with the other ones, you can classify the degree of their, um, their responsiveness based on where they respond, how much of the, the agent they had delivered with and see where they're responding, whether they're severe, moderate, mild, or they don't have any. So that's what's nice about these tests. You can kind of help, it helps you to classify. So this list is similar to the list that um, I showed in the last presentation. Um, if you recall the, the study out of Canada that uh, reevaluated patients who had been diagnosed with asthma, and I showed you a list um, patients who had been diagnosed based on symptoms alone, um, and they were reevaluated and, you know, that 200 patients had been found to not have asthma. So we see that some of that on this list as well. So this, again, just really highlights how important it is that we take advantage of the, the objective tests that we have available to us. You may not have EVH in your area, but I'll bet you you have a lab that has exercise challenge available. So, or that has a methacholine challenge. So we need to make sure that we are advocating for our patients. Um, when I talk about the alternative diagnoses that people see for someone that they have suspected has asthma, or in this particular case, let's say exercise-induced bronchoconstriction, we can't discount the psychological issues. Um, I hear this from the, the, from the um, pediatric pulmonary function labs that I work with, that with our chill, with the kiddos who are athletes, um, as they age and they've been at this high level of competition for long periods of time, um, now they're getting into high school, maybe they're in college, they're not maybe the big fish anymore, the competition is really intense, maybe they're just burned out because they've been doing this sport since they were six years old. How do I tell mom and dad that all of the time and money and investment in this sport, I don't wanna do it anymore? Um, that can cause a lot of anxiety for these kids. And we know that shortness of breath, chest tightness, um, that, could, that could be anxiety. And so um, I have heard from several of the pediatric labs that the anxiety or the psychological um, diagnosis is something that they are in tune to with their kids. And not that we're gonna make that diagnosis in the pulmonary function lab. However, giving them this test result if they have a negative indirect challenge, it's not EIB. So that gives the doctor something to talk about with the patient and their parents um, or their caregivers. Okay, it's not really your lungs. So what do you think it might be? And then that might open up the door for the conversation about the athlete not wanting to do the sport anymore. So I've heard that enough that I think it's really important um, to bring it up. Um, exercise induced vocal cord dysfunction, again, um, that's another one uh, that is oftentimes misdiagnosed as exercise-induced bronchoconstriction. So um, if you have time and you're interested, I would say go to YouTube and, and see if you can find um, some of those videos. So in summary, um, we know that indirect bronchial challenges are um, cause that inflammatory pathway to activate in responsive airways and cause bronchoconstriction. Um, these are what we what are we use to help us diagnose exercise-induced bronchoconstriction, um, and we can also use them to help initiate and titrate um, inhaled corticosteroids with our patients.
Um, there are five as listed here. Um, and you know, you may have access to one or, or maybe more. And that is about it. I think I'm on time. Yeah. Thank you, Heather. You're welcome. That was quite an echo I just heard. Yeah. <laughs> okay, I think we got it. Thank you so much. Um, once again, you are getting very, very uh, positive comments and um, our audience is really appreciating the fact that we have brought some PFT information to their awareness. Yeah. And I do have a few questions. And the very first one says, the slide that you placed on EIB showed a prevalence in certain sports, such as skaters, cross country skiers. Mm -hmm. Possibly, could that be caused more by the cold weather than the sport itself? Well, that's kind of, I think that it's, that's a contributor for sure, because we see it as the, the numbers, it is more prevalent in the cold weather sports. But then also right. with the indoor sports too, like the swimmers, it's pretty, the, the numbers are pretty high with the indoor swimmers too. Okay. And then um, we have one last question that I see. And it's a person who says, I was born in 1971 as a baby. I had severe respiratory issues. According to my dad, the doctor told him I had TB and was going to die. He took me to a place in Pennsylvania. He was told I did not have TB, but I had asthma. How are infants tested for asthma after ruling out the other factors? As an adult, I was also intubated for respiratory rest. After discharge, I was followed by a pulmonologist and he verified the diagnosis using spirometry. So I do not have um, pulmonary function experience with infants or children under the age of six. So I really can't speak to what they do um, with infants. Okay, um, and then we've just had another one come in. And um, in your experience, how do you identify good patient effort versus poor patient effort? So when I was in the pulmonary function lab, it was the consistency of the numbers that they re were produ reproducing, like how reproducible were the numbers? Because if you're faking it, or if you're not giving your best effort, it's hard to reproduce that. Whereas my experience found, I found that when patients are really trying, um, they can reproduce that more so than a false effort. But that's anecdotal for my experience in the PFT lab. Okay, great. Thank you. My experience in a PFT lab was the therapist gets as red as the patient. <laughs> that's a good measure. <laughs> that shows good effort. Yeah. 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 One more question. Okay. Thank you for the excellent presentation. Do you see pulmonologists ordering less methicoline challenge testing? Um, they don't, historically, they simply do not order enough. Now, I would never, ever, ever say that every patient that comes through the PFT lab needs to have a bronchial provocation test because that's simply not true. It's for the patients who do not have clear, um, you don't get a clear picture after doing spirometry with bronchodilators. Um, and for some reason, they stop. And we don't see the, the bronchial provocation tests, including methicoline, utilized um, as much as they could be or should be. Um, and and I, I don't really have an answer for that. I still hear um, from some physicians that they don't need it, that they can just, they're comfortable going with symptoms. Um, they're comfortable, you know, working with the spirometry or, or treating empirically with inhalers after the spirometry, even if it's not um, clear, you know, clear, real clear. So yeah, that's, I, it is, it's just underutilized. They all are. Yeah, I, I have to agree with you there. We just had another question come in. And it's, what are your thoughts of using a peak flow meter for asthma management? My 16-year-old still uses it. His pediatric pulmonologist says it's useless. Oh, oh, 
I am an advocate of peak flow meters. Um, it, it, I know every time I gave a patient a peak flow meter, I feel like they said, oh, I've got four of these in the drawer at home, <laughs> which, you know, okay, that's not really good for cost effectiveness or cost management, right? But I do think that if you look at um, asthma management, we want to head off the exacerbations as much as we can. And so how do we do that? We do that with an objective measure. And the peak flow measure, I feel, can give us good objective data. If you have a patient who's really good about using their peak flow meter every day at the same time, basically, and they start to trend downward, that, that clues them into that something might be happening. And so I do feel that the peak flow meter is a good tool. It's an inexpensive tool. It's easy. Um, and if your patient uses it consistently, I think it can, I think it can give them valuable data. And I don't want to I agree with you on that one. I have seen it really show beneficial in my years as a respiratory therapist. Yeah. And to my audience, um, this is Heather's very first time that she has joined us as a presenter. And I think we just might have to ask her again. We have I'd had such to, positive comments again for you, Heather, and I appreciate your effort and thank you very much. You're very welcome. And I, I, would, I was so looking forward to coming um, to see you in Pigeon Forge because I haven't been there since I was a kid. So I would love to join you sometime. Well, we're hoping to next year. Thanks, Heather. You're welcome. Have a great rest of your conference.